Hello and welcome to this month's issue of Troubleshooting Zen Study and Practice uh, and we've reached the number 37 in the series. So straight in with this month's question. In one podcast you mentioned dealing with lethargy. Will you say something more about this please? So lethargy is certainly a problem that we will face when we're ever establishing a new practice or even an ongoing practice as well. And in fact, this was recognized even by the Buddha himself. There is a formulation in early Buddhism known as the five hindrances. And um, uh, the third one of these hindrances um, is basically lethargy. It's it's called sloth and torpor. Uh, and so we're, we're talking about the same thing here. It's that inability to really motivate oneself. And it speaks to that question of motivation. And motivation is tremendously important, not only because there's intention in it, but also because... Uh, um, you know, it's the motivation that allows us to overcome obstacles uh, as we face them, you know, whether that's just generally in life or, you know, um, whether it's just establishing a new habit and so or or keeping an, a, a good habit going. Um, the other thing is also um, uh, with this that I think is important to say is that we, we're talking about the ordinary everyday lethargy here. We're not talking about anything uh, that's medical or pathological because obviously there is a syndrome known as chronic fatigue syndrome um, and whilst uh, practices such as mindfulness and meditation may be helpful with that, um, there are other causes and conditions that feed into that above and beyond what I'm going to be talking about. Obviously, this is not a medical podcast. This is uh, a Buddhist practice podcast. So uh, just to be clear about that. So um, what can we really sort of say uh, about this uh, lethargy, about this power? And actually, um, it feeds directly into a very Buddhist, a very Zen Buddhist way of seeing what we are doing with this practice. Um, there's Master Dai, who was a Chinese Zen master about a thousand years ago, used to write to his uh, as pupils, his disciples, because he spent part of his life in exile. Um, and we have the collection of his letters known as the Swampland Flowers. You can get translations of that book, which is a very good book. And in one place, Master Dai, talking about uh, this sort of motivation, says to one of his disciples, if you want power, or if you want strength, first you must conserve it. Uh, and basically what he's talking to is is that we, um, you know, the human heart, our heart is a wellspring of energy and power. Um, but alas, because we are not very good at husbandry, we tend to fritter this energy away in lots of ineffective and non-skillful ways. Um, and therefore, you know, we can end up feeling lethargic. In other words, um, we lose power, we have it stolen away from us, and we collude with that theft um, as well. And this ties in very much with the poem called On Faith in the Heart, which is written by the third Chinese patriarch, Master Sozan. And the, the opening lines of that poem um, are well known, uh, and they say, uh, The great way is not difficult, it merely avoids picking and choosing. Now, the great way is the Mahayana, and obviously the Zen school belongs to that school of the Mahayana. So that, that great way which takes us from where we are now to the release from suffering to complete and perfect enlightenment to Buddhahood itself, because that's the, the great way is the Bodhisattva way, of course, um, is not difficult. It merely avoids picking and choosing. So we may sort of say, well, you know, um, I, what is this picking and choosing that he, he talks about? Well, this is based on the wanting and not wanting. This is the grasping that the Buddha referred to in those four noble truths, that second noble truth, uh, the cause of suffering being grasping um, uh, itself. And uh, uh, this is what he's, he's, he's ref this is what Master Sozan is, is actually referring to in this particular um, uh, couplet, that this great way is not difficult, it merely avoids picking and choosing. Well, how do we pick and choose? Um, well, first of all, and, and now we come to really the thing that underpins the whole thing, 
is that in the in the Buddhist view, in the Mahayana view, of which the Zen school is one, and therefore we subscribe to this too, is that everything but all phenomena, what the Chinese used to call the 10,000 things, all phenomena, by which I mean both the physical universe and the world of mentation, the, the uh, uh, world of mind or mind objects, the inner landscape and the outer landscape, um, is powered. It's powered by energy. And this energy is the energy of the Buddha nature, what the Buddha called the Buddha nature, or in Mahayana uh, 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 is called the Buddha nature. And this, this Buddha nature informs all forms. It's not just energy like electricity, but it's also informative as well. And we have this peculiar saying in the uh, northern tradition, in the Mahayana, that says that the passions, you know, um, the afflictions, what's called the kleshas, the passions, the fires, are the Buddha nature. And the Buddha nature is the passions. So uh, we have these two things that go together. Now, you know, the passions or the kleshas are the, uh, is the energy of the Buddha nature in the presence of the delusion of I. So if we go back to that wheel of life, you go and have a look at a Buddhist wheel of life, there at the very center of the wheel, there are those three animals. There's the pig, the cockerel, and the snake. The pig representing delusion, uh, that's the attachment to the notion of a separate self, which is, as the Buddha made quite clear, is illusory. Um, there's the cockerel, which represents wanting, uh, and then there's the snake, which represents aversion, not wanting, or hatred, anger, and so on, fear as well. Um, so those two, the, the wanting and the not wanting, arise in the presence of the delusion of I. And that wanting and not wanting is the same as what Master Sozan is referring to when he talks about picking and choosing. So Sozan's picking and choosing is uh, the wheel of life's wanting and not wanting, the cockerel and the snake. And these things, as I said, arise in the presence of I. So I is the pivot, is the foundation of that picking and choosing. And this is, that's the framing for everything that we do um, in the Zen practice, whether it's the Zazen, whether it's the daily life practice, whether it's the timetable, which we talked about last time um, as well, the practice of restraint um, and so forth, the development of discipline, the Shila practice, uh, the ethical practice, all these things are tied in with that, um, as it were, getting a handle on and uh, restraining this, uh, the picking and choosing of I, because that's what gets in the way. That's what bleeds the energy away. This is why Master Dai said, um, if you want power, first you must conserve it. First you must uh, uh, save it, uh, in other words. So how does that actually work in in, in practice? Well, um, my own late teacher, uh, Venerable Myokioni, Master Dayu, as she's known, um, she used to give a, a, a really good example for this. And, you know, this was something that I could really relate to. Um, so when I was studying for my O-levels uh, back in the day, it was a good few decades ago, um, I, I had to study British and European history, 1870 to 1914. And although I'm very interested in history nowadays, I was not interested in history at all as a teenager. Um, so it was a real pain. It was very difficult because at the end of each academic year, we had exams and I had to take a history exam. And, you know, I had certain favorite subjects. Sciences were my favorite. So I studied those, you know, quite eagerly. Uh, but when it came to history, I would put it off and put it off and put it off. Uh, and then it would come to the, you know, the last leg, the last minute, and I couldn't put it off any further. And I'd sort of reluctantly turn around and say, well, okay, you know, I'll, I'll better get the books out and study this. So I get the book out, open it up at the uh, relevant chapter, I would read the first page, and I would have that experience that I'm sure a lot of you will know, is that you get to the bottom of the page, and you just sort of think, my mind's a complete blank. I, I have no recollection of what it is that I've just read and so I read it again and my mind would be all over the place I'd be thinking about 10,000 other things 
and the same thing would happen. And so I'd read it again. And by the time I got to the bottom of the page now, what happened is that my eyelids were closing. I was feeling really tired. And, you know, I'd start yawning and I'd really feel like this, this sort of, uh, I was just drained of energy. And so, you know, I, I'd sort of say to myself, well, you know, maybe what uh, I need to do is just turn in, have an early night. Um, you know, I can wake up fresh tomorrow and then I can really apply myself. And so, you know, I get ready for bed, go into bed. And I think I just need to sort of relax, you know, unwind a little bit before I turn the light out. I'll just continue reading that um you know, racy novel, that exciting novel that I was, that I'd been reading, just one chapter, just to unwind. And, you know, two hours later, I'm turning the pages eagerly, wide awake, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Where has that lethargy gone? Where has that feeling of overwhelming tiredness actually gone? And this is where we're caught out, because energy underpin this energy that we're talking about this power underpins all states of consciousness and lethargy is just a state of mind is a state of consciousness and wakefulness and focus and attention is this is also a state of mind and it is the same power that underpins both the thing is it's not that energy is high or low because we often say this don't we we say oh my energy is sort of low today or my energy is high today um, in the past we used to talk about being in high or low spirits same sort of thing as if it's a sort of volume effect it's not a volume effect it is an appearance effect the energy can appear as lethargy full powered full throttled um, absolutely revved up with full on lethargy or it can appear as revved up and full powered focus clarity um, attention completely in the zone and on it uh, and that's the thing so the point is the appearances can be deceptive appearances can be part of that delusion and it's not until you test it a little bit such as in the example that I gave when you realize that now when you realize that actually what is happening there what transforms the energy into lethargy and what transforms the energy into focus it's very simple I don't like history but I really like that racy exciting novel that I'm reading so what's making the difference is the picking and choosing just as Master Sozan uh, has pointed out picking and choosing um, transforms the energy so if it's something that I like I will happily give my heart into it I will happily give my um, uh, 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 give myself wholeheartedly into it and when I give myself wholeheartedly into something then it takes off then it becomes vital then it becomes alive but if I won't, if I'm stingy, if I'm miserly, then, of course, I don't want to do it. Um, and I won't give myself. Uh, and if I don't give myself into something, we experience it as lifeless. We experience it as dead. Um, and it has nothing in it for me. And there we have it again. I like it therefore I give myself into it I don't like it therefore I won't give myself into it completely changes the experience of something and this is why you know in one of the courses that I give um, at the Buddhist Society um, we have an uh, we have an exercise where we have what's called uh, called the the disliked chore so what you do is that you you pick a chore that you don't like you know, something you've been really putting off because you've never wanted to do it. You know, maybe it's, I don't know, ironing. Maybe it's, um, you know, cleaning the car. Maybe it's uh, cleaning the kitchen cupboards. Whatever it is. Something that you know you don't like. And, and what you do is you make it as an experiment. Um, and, you know, you don't switch the radio on. You don't distract yourself. You're going to wholeheartedly do this. And physically, you really give yourself into it that's the key by using the physical form by using the body and doing it with energy actually doing it you know faking that enthusiasm with the body it doesn't matter how i feel on the inside you know if you uh, if you really 
um, give yourself um, into something in this way physically what happens and you know the people you know people go away doing this little bit intrigued obviously they're curious so that helps as well uh, to see what happens and they all come back and they say that the experience this time has is very different from their previous experiences of doing the same task normally they're fighting against themselves in order to do it uh, but with this one because they did it with some vigor they actually used their body and and you know, obviously you can't see me because i'm speaking to you as a disembodied voice but but if you could see that that really the 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 whole body is goes right into it um, and that's why I always say to them, look, pick a physical task because it's much easier with a physical task to give yourself into it. You know, if you have to sweep the yard, you know, you can sweep it half-heartedly whilst thinking about something else. Or you can grasp that broom and sweep and sweep and sweep as if it was the only thing that mattered on the earth. And, and with that power and enthusiasm and my goodness it doesn't take much and then suddenly there's a sort of flow that comes with it and it's why it's called being in the zone uh, in fact so this is something that um, uh, uh, we we can experiment with now it's very easy to do these things one-off but how do we actually keep it going well there's a number of little tips that, that we can use for this one of them obviously is by making vows and making regular dedications I mean you know if you're going to start a, um, say a meditation practice or you know if you find that the mindfulness practice the daily life practices is getting a bit limp and a bit diffuse you know, if you've got a shrine at home, make yourself a little Buddha shrine, go and light some incense, go and stand before the Buddha, put your hands together and say to the Buddha, you know, um, Lord Buddha, I dedicate this day, and, you know, do it when you get up there, I dedicate this day to really giving myself wholeheartedly into this practice, into this daily life practice. Help me to give myself wholeheartedly in for the benefit of all beings. And that adding that benefit of all beings is really good because that's a very important motivation in Mahayana. If you know something about the Bodhisattva path, you will know that already. And so just add that little formula onto the end because it stops it being about me, 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 which as we've seen is the picker and the chooser. That's the problem. It takes it out from myself as a center and reconnects us back into that wonderful web of um, interrelating um, that is the true nature of things. In fact, this is what's known as shunyata. So that's certainly one way we can do it. The other way is obviously we talked about the timetable. You can look it up. Um, uh, Troubleshooting Zen Study and Practice number 36 has tips on setting up a timetable. The reason that's good and, and what that's all about is practice of restraint and just, just learning to go along with things. Um, at the right time, now is the time to get up, now is the time to go to work, now is the time to do the zazen, now is the time to go to bed, and why that works, and, and how that establishment of habits, and putting the, and allowing the energy to flow into that form of the habit, um, strengthens it um, as well, and makes our practice much easier. And also the physical form as well. You know, if we uh, experiment with the physical form. If we sit in a slovenly way or in a slothful way, we feel slothful. If we sit in a collected way, slightly more held together, a bit more sort of upright, don't just let myself go, um, then that also um, is is a way of crafting that energy and cultivating that energy into a more alert form. Have you ever wondered why we practice Zazen sitting up, for example? Why we don't practice it lying down on the bed, curled up with our eyes closed? You know, there's good reason for that. <laughs> and you can experiment with it. Um, so, yeah. But, or why we don't practice Zazen slumped on the sofa watching TV. It's not that form is simply not conducive to what we're trying to do. So there is a form that goes along with things. Things have a form. And if you look at animals, you know, animals have a form. Look at a cat, how a cat sits, for example, how a cat crouches when it's about to pounce. Um, it, it has a natural form that enables it um, to carry out its activities. And, and all things do that. All 
living things do that and human beings do that too. So um, this is certainly something that we can uh, uh, that we can experiment with. So again, uh, the, uh, this it's about cultivation of energy. Um, whether we cultivate it skillfully or unskillfully, do we allow our energies to be frittered away into long and pointless thought streams, long and pointless an uh, anxieties and worries, uh, and so forth? Uh, do we let it get frittered away into more and more thinking about I, me, and mine, uh, and what I'm all about? And and notice that when I do that, that that puffs that up, that that uh, amplifies it, it exacerbates it, and in fact makes our feelings and our problems worse. Um, or do we give ourselves, do we let go and really using the form, give ourselves into the more skillful habits uh, that we are trying to seeking to cultivate through our ethical practice, through the practice of meditation, uh, and also through you know the the practice of of wisdom. Uh, and by that I include you know the books that you read, the podcasts. Uh, uh, we listen to, you know, that there should be a good dollop of dharma there as well, because that in itself, you know, stirs us. If we if we resonate with the dharma, then listening to the dharma or reading something about the dharma, reading something, you know, um, a, a, a bit meaty uh, about the dharma, really can sort of help us uh, enthuse a little bit, bit more and to resuscitate uh, that motivation. Okay. Uh, don't forget, as usual, if you have a question that you would like answering, send it along to uh, the Zen Gateway, and uh, our email is Rinzai, that's R-I-N-Z-A-I, as in Master Rinzai, Rinzai at thezengateway.com, Rinzai at thezengateway.com. Okay, and uh, see you again next week. Sorry, next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.